one doesn't have to be in the faith very long to discover the reality that you and I find ourselves in the midst of spiritual warfare. Can you say amen to that? Like, it's like day one, right? You don't have to know anything else about the scripture. You're like, uh, something's different. Something's weird. I'm, I'm going through things. There are challenges I'm facing now in life, but it, it hits you different. It hits different once you've placed your faith in Christ, that you've trusted Christ. We are becoming aware then now of this reality that has been there behind the scenes, but somehow comes to the forefront. We are in the midst of a spiritual battle. And there's two realities to this battle I want you to keep in mind as we walk through these final commands, these final directives that Paul, the apostle of the Lord, is giving, giving to Timothy, this apostolic delegate that was left at the church at Ephesus to put things into order, to, to teach and instruct the people of God, and to deal with the false teachers that were in their midst. And the two things I want you to keep in mind as regards this spiritual battle is that this battle is taking place on two fronts. There's one that's an assault on your faith, and the other is an assault on the faith. There's a battle for my faith, and there's a battle for the faith. There's a battle for your faith, there's a battle for the faith. And I hope you see that as we go through this particular uh, charges and commands in the letter to Timothy. We are in the midst of a spiritual warfare. We have a very spiritual enemy that wants to thwart your personal faith in Jesus Christ, sabotage your trust in Jesus Christ, undermine the authority and truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God, and there is the all-out assault on the very word of God, the very truth of God itself. So Paul's final charge to Timothy here, the close of this letter, is going to give us some very helpful Uh, instruction on the Christian life, some of it pertaining to this spiritual warfare and how we are to engage in what he calls the good fight of the faith. Hear the words of the Lord, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 through the end. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. That's for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. These are the words of the Lord. Paul begins this final section here, designating something really profound In regards to Timothy, he says, but as for you, O man of God. Now, he uses his name at the end, but here he calls him a man of God. Now, this section is in no ways disconnected from everything we have been looking at before it. Because what we're seeing here in that previous passage here was Paul's 
takedown and undressing of the false teachers, of the, the charlatans who were using godliness as a means of gain, who were, who were consumed with controversies and quarrels about words and, and the mythologies and speculations that he mentions in chapter 1. And now he's transitioning to these final words to Timothy. But as for you, O man of God... It's a clear contrast between those false teachers and who Timothy is. But as for you, you are to be radically different than them, than those false teachers. You are a man of God. Now, we use that term kind of flippantly sometimes. We refer to one another as men of God, women of God. But for that in Scripture, it is a profound thing Because in the Old Testament, there are only a handful of people that were referred to as men of God. There wasn't a whole lot of them. You have Moses, the servant of the Lord, was called a man of God. You have Samuel called a man of God. You have David called a man of God. The prophets Elijah and Elisha were called men of God. But there isn't a whole lot of references to men of God. And now all of a sudden... We have this designation given to Timothy. And it's kind of remarkable considering, again, that Timothy was a young man. Now, remember, young didn't mean he was a teenager. He was probably well into his 30s, mid-30s or so. But he was a young man relatively to the culture of that time. He was still considered a novice, still had things to learn. And Timothy is giving him this designation that was referred to uh, only for our Old Testament heroes. Yeah, Moses, man of God, sure. David, man of God. The prophets, men of God, servants of God, these were representatives of God. These were the mouthpieces, the spokespeople for the sovereign God. And then we have Timothy. Fearful Timothy, as we looked at. Young Timothy. Timothy afflicted with some bodily ailments, but he's a man of God. But as for you, a man of God. And I think there's two reasons There may be more, but at least two, I think, that Paul calls him a man of God. One of them was to kind of perk his ears up to what he was about to tell him. There are weighty charges coming. And you're a man of God, and this is serious business. The challenges in Ephesus are great. The opponents are great. The opposition is great. But you are a man of God. Listen to these things. Take heed. But second, I believe, it was to ground Timothy in the truth Of who he truly is in Christ Jesus. He is a man of God. Not is becoming a man of God. He is a man of God. By virtue of being in Christ. By virtue of of being called to, to the ministry. By being called to the office here as an apostolic delegate. You can call him a pastor, an elder. There's A lot of scholars have different views of what his role was there at at Ephesus, but nonetheless, he was called by God. He is a man of God. He is a, a minister of God, a minister of the word. And he wants to remind him of who he is in contrast to those that are opposing him. Those who are bringing about a different uh, doctrine, a different teaching, who are distorting the gospel and the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he was dealing with at Ephesus was strong. The warfare was intense assaults from within the church and, of course, from without in the culture at large, the pagan culture of Ephesus at his time. So he's saying, Timothy, you are a man of God. Stand tall and attend to the task to which you were called. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll look at this in a few weeks, Paul, writing to Timothy in regards to the, the purpose of the ministry of the Word of God, In verse 17 there of 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, he says it is to make the man of God complete. And to make the man of God equipped for every good work. That is the work of the formation of the word of God in the life of the church. To build us up, to complete, certainly for the minister, definitely for the members. Definitely for all of the body of Christ. Which is why the word of God needs to be proclaimed. Which is why the authority of the word of God has to be held high. Why it needs to be the authority in the life, not only of the believer, but in the life of the church. Why we must herald the truths of the gospel. Because it is what grows us up in the faith. It is what develops us. It is what equips us and completes us for every good work. We would become deformed Christians. Deformed believers. And there's a lot of those out there, aren't they? 
there. They don't know the Word of God. The Word of God isn't the foundation of their life. They're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But Timothy says, Timothy, you are a man of God, and it's the ministry of the Word, that continual teaching and proclamation of the Word of God, of instruction in the Word of God, which will complete you and equip you for every good work. We need to pay attention to these directives. There are five we're going to look at in this passage. There are more of them, but I'm kind of grouping them into five here for the sake of time and for us to finish First Timothy today. Um, we could spend weeks on each one of these, but we need to pay attention to these brothers and sisters. Like I said, we don't read these pastoral epistles and go, ah, those things are only for the preachers. Those are only for the pastors. Those are only for the elders of the church. These are for every single believer, every single Christian. It's relevant for us. Guess what? You're a man of God. You're a woman of God if you're in Christ Jesus. It's an astounding how it, the apostles refer to Christians, not as Christians, but as saints. Have you ever seen yourself as a saint? I know some of you don't act like saints. We don't, right? Positionally, in Christ, we are saints, holy ones. If you're in Christ, that's what you are. Now, through our process of our sanctification, we're living up to this reality, but it's a reality now, nonetheless. So for, for Timothy to be called a man of God, it's, it's not because he was like Moses or like David at but it's what he is in Christ Jesus. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go here. Now, there are five directives here. Five, there's going to be four successive commands that you uh, are going to see there. They, they come in rapid-fire order, the order there. The first is to flee. The second is to pursue. The third is to fight. And the fourth is to take hold. And then there is a really sober charge that Timothy is presented with to keep. All right, to keep. So flee, pursue, fight, take hold, and keep. Let's look at the first there. Flee, verse 11 there, the first part. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Now we know flee means to what? To run. It's not that little insect thing, right? Flee means to run, run, move away from something as quickly as possible. But what are the things that he is supposed to flee or run away from? What are these things? Well, these things are everything that characterized the false teachers. Everything that characterized those who deviated from the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, from the gospel, from the sound doctrine, those things that divide the church, that, that create uh, strife in the church, the arrogance, the ignorance of the false teachers, their craving for controversy, their quarreling, their religious delusion, right? He, he's to flee from the love of money, which, which Paul wrote to him is a root of all kinds of evil. He is to flee from all of those things. If the false teachers are here, he's over here. That's what he needs to do. Now, in his second letter... To Timothy, he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2 to flee youthful passions. He's reminding him again that there is an aspect to the spiritual strategy, not just of the minister of the word of God, but for every believer, there is a spiritual strategy that is very important for us to know. And it involves flight. It involves fleeing sin. Something you and I need to engage in, in our battle against sin. In this battle for my faith... Part of it entails fleeing certain things, fleeing sin, fleeing evil. It's important to our ongoing sanctification. Now, it's a negative command, and he's going to then buttress it with a positive command subsequently when he tells him to pursue certain things. But for now, he is to flee. And notice, he doesn't say, hey, reason with them, with these things. He doesn't say even at that point, stand up to these things. Reason with them. Justify them. Try to, you know, quote the promises of God around them. No, he's telling him to flee these things, to run. Now, it's common sense for us to run from danger, isn't it? 
Now, I know not everyone has common sense. It's not as common, right, as it's made out to be. We flee from things that uh, are a threat to us or a perceived threat to us. We typically don't sit there and entertain those things, right? If we encounter a, a, a venomous snake, I know we have some Rambos amongst us here who, who, who would revel in that and want to take a machete to it. I, I have slain my few serpents in life. But typically, what do we want to do? We want to, get, we want to be removed from it as quickly as possible. You ever watch those videos of these fools who get out of their cars when they're on like a safari drive, right? And there's videos of them being dragged away, right? Not much common sense there. There's a, there's a danger, but they're acting like there isn't one. And there's an aspect of our spiritual life that we need to realize that it involves when we're confronted with temptation to sin, the very thing that you and I are called to do because of danger is not to stand there, is not to quote scripture, is not to speak in tongues, it's not to reason with it, but it's to run. It's to remove yourself as far away from the temptation, from the situation as possible. What we have to look as is, is the story in the, of the life of the patriarch Joseph as a wonderful example of what that looks like. Now, Joseph, as you know the story in Genesis there, he was seduced on a daily basis. But there was a moment that he found himself alone in the house with Potiphar's wife. I don't think he intended for that to happen. Clearly he had been rejecting whatever it was that she was doing. But in this moment, she grabs him. Probably something she had not done before. And what did Joseph do at that moment? He didn't say the same things he had been telling her before. Oh, how can I do that? Potiphar has taken me in, you know, I'm his servant. No, no. It says he runs, leaving his cloak behind. Now, I don't know if that he ran off in his undies. I have no idea. It doesn't elaborate here. He ran. He fled the temptation. It's astounding sometimes how little running we do from temptation in our Christian walk. We have a besetting sin in our life. There's something that trips us up over and over and over again. And the very thing we do do not do is remove ourselves from that temptation. Guys struggling with lust. Women struggling with lust. They don't remove themselves from that temptation. They say, oh, I'm going to pray in front of my computer. No, maybe you need to disconnect from the internet. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's lying. Whatever that situation is, that temptation to sin, that that situation where you're placed in an evil position where you may compromise your faith, the strategy is to flee those things. Flee youthful lusts. Why is he telling that to Timothy? Well, Timothy is a young man. Again, still considered a youth. There were going to be things that were going to be tempting to Timothy. There were going to be temptations that would assail him, this battle for his own faith. And what Timothy needed to do in that moment was to take off, not leave the church, but to separate himself from that temptation. And it is something you and I need to do. Run from the very things that cause us spiritual harm. Not run to sin, but run from it. When we have sinful thoughts and sinful desires that creep up, those are the very moments. What, it, what brought that on? Okay. Maybe you're looking at some images that are stirring those things up in your life. Maybe you're, there's a relationship in your life that is stirring these things up in your heart. You need to remove yourself from that temptation. Okay. Run in opposite directions. So I'd ask you to think about that in your own life right now. What temptation to sin do you need to flee from? What is it? We need to practice this kind of sanctified flight in our Christian life. The second command he gives here to Timothy is to pursue. This is the positive side of this command to flee. Now it's to pursue. But what is he to pursue? Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Right? So flee evil, but then what? 
pursue good. It's not just enough to run from sin. Now he needs to run to something else. These particular spiritual qualities and things of spiritual value that Paul lists here. Now this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch and means. You know that in Paul's letters, he loves to use these lists. He names some of the items that are representative of the whole thing, right? The whole of the Christian's spiritual life, but righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. In 2 Timothy chapter 22, we see this same negative, positive, positive uh, admonition and exhortation. 2 Timothy 2.22, he says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Flee and pursue. What is that? That's the Christian's life of ongoing sanctification. We're to mortify sin, put sin to death, but but that's not all. There's also the vivification aspect of our sanctification. Put sin to death, but then put on what? The the righteousness of Christ. The good works of the gospel. The spiritual things. The things that have enduring and eternal spiritual value and spiritual quality. We are to put on the new man while simultaneously putting off the old. Our Christian sanctification consists of that. Our growth in godliness is of fleeing and pursuing in the Christian life. That's how we grow in godliness. Leaps in behind. And reach forward to what is good and godly. And I think where a lot of Christians get hung up in their sanctification. Where they feel they're not progressing. It's because their obsession is with their sin. The obsession is that sin that keeps persisting in their heart and life. That temptation that continues to rear its ugly head. And time and time again they fall into that temptation. It it continues to trip them up. They become obsessed with sin management. How how do I manage this sin in my life or manage around that sin in my life because I'm not getting the the spiritual victory in my Christian walk in this area. So everything's about stop sinning, stop sinning. You ever done that? That white knuckling of your walk where there is this temptation, this sin that continue to to befuddle you and all you want, all you are obsessed with is how do I get past this in my life? But that's only a one-sided approach. Because what do we do in order to stop sinning? We try to put up all of these rules and regulations in our life, right? We, we end up falling now in a legalistic bent when all we do is are obsessed about our sin, focused on our sin and how to stop sinning. But fleeing sin is only one side of the equation of sanctification. Putting sin to death, right, is only one side of the equation in our sanctification. We, are, we have to run from sin, but we have to run to something else. And in this case, it's righteous thinking and living. It's godly belief and behavior. It's a greater affection for God, trusting in what He has done for us in Christ, patiently enduring all things when life gets tough because our hope is in Christ. It's running from evil, but it's pursuing then Christ. It's going after Christ, going after righteousness, going after godliness. We tend to overemphasize our ability to resist temptation and sin. We think, that's what I've got to do. And then we underemphasize the power of obedience and godly pursuit in the spiritual life, fueled by the grace of God. And so we stumble and fumble through this, this, this in our life, and there is... No joy in your life or or no seeming spiritual victory uh, in your spiritual life. As we got this flipped around, we have to pursue godliness and righteousness because that's the only way we will stop obsessing with our sin and focusing on Christ and what he has accomplished for us. What is our continual exhortation here? It isn't look at your sin. You no good, filthy, wretched sinner. Keep looking at that sin so you stop doing it. That's not the exhortation, is it? No, it's look to Christ. See and savor our Savior. Because that will cause you to stop looking at that and going after that. It isn't about being sinless in this life. You and I will never attain sinless perfection in this life. Only one has accomplished that. And it's not you and it's not going to be me. 
But we will sin less when our obsession is Jesus and not our sin. When our focus is Christ and not on my past and all of the stuff that continues to, to weigh me down in my spiritual walk. I need to continue to look to Christ. I need to go back to what we talked about last week. Do I see that Christ is enough? For my ultimate contentment in life, do I see Christ is enough to even gain victory in my spiritual life? Do I see Christ is enough that He has provided richly for me everything in this life for godliness? So I don't obsess about my sin. I'm focusing on my Savior. It makes all the difference. Less on our sin and more on Christ. He died for your sins. He paid for your sins. His victory over sin secures our victory over sin, brothers and sisters. Paul tells us this very thing. This is his strategy. When we were going through our city group study in Philippians, we saw this. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Paul writes, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. That's the apostle of the Lord saying he didn't hit perfection. He didn't arrive at the goal of of that kind of perfection. No, he says, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. In Christ Jesus. What's the goal? It isn't overcoming sin. The goal is attaining Christ. The goal is Christ Jesus himself. But you see he's saying the same thing here. Fleeing and pursuing. I leave behind and I press on. Leave behind and press on. And that is the Christian walk. We engage in both. John Stott in his commentary here in 1 Timothy wrote, we're simply to run from evil as we run from danger and to run after goodness as we run after success. We're to do both of those things. Run from, run to Christ. The third command, fight. In 12a, fight the good fight of the faith. You flee, you pursue, and you fight. Now, the Christian life, again, is not all flight. It involves fight. It's not just running. There's a point of standing here. But it isn't standing against temptation to sin. Okay? The standing has to do with the faith. What is the faith? He's not talking about his personal faith here. The faith, that definite article, the, tells us he's talking about the faith. All right? The sound words of Jesus Christ, the teachings of Christ, the gospel, the truth, the word of God. Fight the good fight of the faith. Not a new directive. We saw this back in chapter 1. He tells Timothy that he is to wage the good warfare. It's the same thing. He calls it here the, 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 the good fight of the faith. There he called it the, the waging a good war, warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. It's the very thing Paul says that he has done in his own life. 2 Timothy, which is a letter that Paul wrote very close to the end of his life, writes to uh, Timothy here and he says in in 4-7 of 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight. What I'm telling you to do, I've already done. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's what he's done. Now, take note of those military and athletic metaphors that Paul uses here in regards to what Timothy is to engage in and what you and I are to engage in as, as, as believers. There's that fighting, there's that military um, illustration, and finishing the race. In fact, the very word used uh, for the verb there, to fight, is a word found throughout Scripture, and it's translated both ways, fighting as well as running, running the race or fighting. Okay, uh, because it's 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 used in both of those particular contexts. There's some translations that have actually looked at this and called it, or he's, where he's actually telling Timothy to run the good race. Yeah. But I like that fighting analogy. Fighting is good. There's a there's a good time to fight. Not all fighting is good, but some fighting is good. And this particular cause is noble, and 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 very worthy here. Okay. 
Uh, it's a fight for the faith. This reminds us once again that we are in, a warf- in warfare, a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare. It's, and, and, and it's going to involve effort, strenuous effort, right? The Christian life consists of that. There's nothing easy about the Christian life. I come from a distinctive where it was, well, come to faith in Christ because it's going to solve all your problems. No, it doesn't. It creates a whole host of other ones. But they're good and necessary. And Paul uses these metaphors to remind Timothy, to remind believers that this is hard stuff. This is difficult. It is agonizing. It is strenuous. It is rigorous. Just like an athlete prepares to compete, goes through rigorous training, strenuous training. That word was used of, of the, those who wrestled. Think about that imagery of rolling in the dirt. I always thought it was kind of weird guys wrestling with each other. It's kind of strange. But it happens. Some of you probably wrestled when you were younger. I'm sorry if I offended you. <laughs> Still weird. But, but he's saying this is what the Christian life consists of. You've got to fight. There's a time where you have to fight. And what you have to fight for and what's a good fight is anything that has to do with the faith. The very last instruction Paul gives to Timothy in his letter is to do what? To guard the good deposit. What's the good deposit? It's the faith. It's the gospel. These are synonymous terms that Paul uses to describe the very same thing here. He's to guard the deposit that was entrusted to him. The whole teaching of the Christian faith. All of the apostolic teaching. Those were the things that were under attack at Ephesus. That's why he opens the letter. Hey, Timothy, I charge you. You need to tell those dudes to stop teaching a different doctrine. Why? The faith was under assault. It was under attack. And Timothy's main task was to hold the ground. Stand firm for the faith and fight against all those who oppose the faith. He's not to give up any ground to his opponents. This is not a physical battle. He's not saying, hey man, I'll throw some punches here. It may come to that. I defer to Nehemiah who ripped out some beards, right? That's not what he's talking about here. This is a spiritual battle first and foremost. And it's a battle, a contending for the truth. And we're going to look at that in Jude here in just a few moments. He's to safeguard the truth. How does he do that? Well, he's got to faithfully proclaim it first and foremost. He's got to be heralding that truth before God's people over and over and over again. He's to engage the good fight by defending the truth when it is imperiled by false teachers. Look at all the ways that Timothy is instructed in this letter. I'm just giving you a handful here. Verse 1 3, to con- he has to confront and stop those who are teaching a different doctrine. 118 and 19, he's to wage the good warfare, holding to the faith. In 3 2, he's to appoint elders who can faithfully teach the word of God. In 4 13, he's to devote himself to the public reading of the scriptures, to exhortation, and to teaching. And here in our passage, he's to fight the good fight, keep the commandment, and guard the good deposit. Would you not say this was an important task for Timothy? An important thing that he had been entrusted. Here is the truth. Guard it. Keep it. Defend it. Thunder it. Proclaim it. Refute. Correct. Teach. Exhort. Over and over and over again. Because you're going to be opposed. This is not a one-time thing. This is going to be a continual thing. If this happened in the first century, what do you think we find ourselves in here now 2,000 plus years removed? And through God's beautiful, sovereign, and providential work, look how the truth has been kept for 2,000 plus years. And here we are today proclaiming this very same truth. But we cannot just rest on our laurels here. We have to do the same thing. We have to fight the good fight of the faith. Not just my job. It's all of our job to do. All of us have a role in this. The faith 
has been under attack in every age, and it's under attack in our age today. We're all called to respond here, to fight this good fight of the faith. In Jude 3 and 4, Jude writes, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend. That word contend, same Greek word or the same Greek word derivative as fight. Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our Lord, of our God, into what? Sensuality and deny our only master, Lord Jesus Christ. What was Jude dealing with and addressing? Same thing that was happening at Ephesus. False teachers teaching perversions of the gospel. And what are God's people to do? Now, I'll mind you, remind you here, Jude's letter is a general letter to the church. It's not a pastoral letter. It's a general letter. This was for the whole church. This letter was written for the instruction and edification of all of the church. He's saying the same thing as Paul is saying. Contend, fight the good fight of the faith. Kent Hughes, in his commentary on the pastorals, writes, Our generation must contend for the faith. We must not be contentious, but we must fight for the apostolic faith. Why? Doctrine is all important because it determines the course of our lives. The truth of the gospel is everything. It is the difference between life and death. We must withstand false teachers. We must think clearly as we define our theology. We must never compromise the truth. The gospel is at stake. How people come to faith and salvation in Christ Jesus is what is at stake. Not all proclaimed and preached from churches across the world today is the message of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It may have hints at godliness. It may use Christian language. It may refer to Jesus, but it is not Christ alone that is proclaimed. And if God's people don't know His Word, don't know the truth, and don't stand firm in it in the midst of a culture, right, who is continually opposing it, and from within the church, the the assailments from aberrant teachings and distortions of the gospel, then we will fail at our task to contend and fight the good fight of the faith. Because the spiritual warfare is intense. And I think back in the 30, I don't know, whatever, 37 years of, 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 of having trusted Christ for salvation, um, I, can't, I can't math right now. Math and preaching the word don't go together. But, but I, I think of maybe what I'm thinking of spiritual warfare at that time then and what it looks like today, it's a different world altogether. And those of you who have been in the faith for a while certainly can sense uh, that in our world today. It is fierce. It's intense. The battle for truth is, is one I have not encountered in my own lifetime. I, every generation has to contend with this in a specific way in its time. And we are finding our unique one here now in our day and age. The kind of depravity that we're seeing, the kind of uh, distortions and, 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 and sexual perversion and all these things are at, are at a level that is off the charts in our time and in our generation here. So there's that battle for our faith, brothers and sisters. And we feel it. We walk through it. We experience it in our day-to-day Christian life. In Ephesians chapter 6, this is why Paul reminds every believer, what do they need to do? They need to arm themselves with Christ, the armor of God. To do what? To stand firm. To stand against this the wickedness, to stand against the demonic opposition that we find in our world, to, to stand against the distortions of the truth. But then here we also have the battle for the faith. And your responsibility, right, in this battle for the faith, brothers and sisters, is knowing the Word of God, standing on the truth and authority of the Word of God, you do not compromise the truth. You do not compromise the truth. 
you stand firm in the faith. If you're standing firm and I'm standing firm and we're standing firm, we are holding the ground in, in the, in wherever God has placed us. In the very ground God has put us in this time and place in history, in this geographical locale, you and I have this responsibility to contend for the faith and stand firm in the truth. Eternal destinies are at stake. The gospel is at stake. The truth is at stake. Stand firm for truth in a godless culture. Stand firm against false teachers. Call them out. First of all, don't listen to them. You won't listen to them if you know God's word. There's that distinctive tinge of, ah, this isn't the gospel. This isn't the truth. We'll, we'll send you running in another direction. And also warn others of it. Just call them out. I called a few out from the pulpit last week. And from time to time I call them out. And I'll continue to call them out. And if I hear you listening to them, I'm going to let you know. And if you hear someone else listening to them around here, you let them know. It's false teaching. It's false gospel. Do not compromise. Because every day you and I are going to be tempted just to let go of the gospel a little bit more and more. Guy I used to listen to, a famous Christian musician, um, years back. I kind of liked some of his music. Certainly his words were very uh, penetrating and insightful and theologically correct, but uh, he's gone off the deep end now, and he's a practicing homosexual. And uh, one of the things that was uh, he had uh, posted, and he was kind of reposting a message someone sent him, and the message was something to the effect of, you know, you you represent Jesus more than every Christian I know has represented Jesus. And I'm sitting like, yeah, because we're not talking about the same Jesus. Right? But you can read that and go, wow, people really think that he must be really an incredible Christian. Because look at people are saying they see Jesus in him. But it's the Jesus of his own making. It's the Jesus of their own making. It is not the Jesus of the Bible. It is not the Jesus who is king of the universe and who can save to the utter, uttermost. So yeah, if the world is applauding your Christian walk, you're not walking the Christian walk. You're not. You're not. Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you also. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. The temptation is we want to be liked. We want to be affirmed. We don't want to be seen as a bigot, a homophobe, a, a hater, a, you know, someone who's not loving, right? Because the, the chief mantra of our age is love your neighbor. But guess what has to precede love your neighbor? Love of God. You should love the Lord your God first. Love of neighbor flows out of our love for God. But love of neighbor does not mean compromise the truth. Love of neighbor does not mean affirm someone who's going off into destruction. We have to stand firm for truth. And I mean for us to have a spine in this day and age, brothers and sisters. I don't want us to be these compromising, wishy-washy. Where does St. Church stand? Here's where St. Church stands. Do we get everything right? No, no one can get everything right. But we're going to strive to be as faithful to God's word as we can be even if that means we're going to be hated. And we will be. I can promise you that. Again, this is not about being contentious. This is not about being a jerk for Jesus. Right? We, we're not that. This doesn't mean being unloving. No, the most loving thing we can do is warn people of the destruction that is awaiting for them, the wrath of God that can be averted and has been averted through Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do. Fight the good fight of the faith, brothers and sisters. Don't compromise. We need to finish chapter 6, don't we? All right. The fourth command, take hold. 12b, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. What's Paul talking about here? How do you take hold of the eternal life? That sounds like something so nebulous, right? 
the eternal life. That's like the future, isn't it? That's something out there. What's he talking about here? Take hold of the eternal life. What is eternal life? When we think about eternal life, we're thinking about the glories of this world to come, right? Everything Jesus has promised us and the things that we need to place our hope in, the blessed <clears throat> hope, Christ's return, the inauguration, the consummation of all things, right? The new heavens and the new earth. Yes, that is eternal life. Those are the things that we hope for, but that's not all. Look what Jesus says in John chapter 3. John uh, John chapter 17, verse 3. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. Now, this is Jesus' prayer to his Father, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What's eternal life? Knowing God, the one true God, and the one he has sent, Jesus Christ. There's no other way to eternal life. Eternal life is found in nothing and no one else save Jesus Christ. So he's saying this is eternal life. This is it, knowing the only true God and Christ. But the emphasis here, when we think about eternal life, is not on the everlasting reality of eternal life, the, the duration of that epoch and that time. What Paul is referring to here is the qualitative state of this eternal life. Quality, not quantity. So I ask myself, if he's saying take hold of the eternal life, is he telling him to do that in the future or is he telling him to do that right now? What do you think? Now. When do we possess eternal life? Some off future return of Jesus? Or do we possess it now in Christ Jesus? We possess it now, don't we? We have it now. This is the already not yet reality of of what it means to be in union with uh, uh, with Christ Jesus. We possess eternal life now. It is present possession and it is also a future hope. This eternal life is the knowledge of God the Father and Christ the Son. This eternal life is walking in this newness of life that we have in our union with Christ. It is the the forgiveness of sins. It's experiencing the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our day-to-day Christian walk. It is knowing the peace of Christ, the love of God, and everything that has been graciously provided for us in its fullness and richness in Christ Jesus. Take hold, Timothy, of the eternal life that you have now. But you say, wait a minute. How is that even possible when I think of this day-to-day struggle uh, I experience every day to walk in this fullness of life that Jesus said we have? How do we do that? How do we walk in this joy and freedom of this eternal life? I I, I imagine he's trying to encourage Timothy here. Listen, what I've called you to is hard. What the Lord has called you to you is hard. And it would seem impossible if you're not taking hold of this eternal life. If you're not walking in the fullness of what all that eternal life represents for you now in Christ Jesus, this is going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible. Because the reality is you and I can possess something without actually embracing and enjoying it. You and I possess things right now, material things that we don't even enjoy. That could be a number of things, but you probably just pictured something in your house right now. I possess a motorcycle I do not presently enjoy. I want to, but I don't. You possess eternal life presently in Christ Jesus. But for one reason or another, maybe we're not fleeing, maybe we're not pursuing, maybe we're not fighting the good fight. We are not taking hold of the eternal life right now that you and I should be. I think of that verb translated there in English as take hold. 
that word is really interesting. That verb tense in the, in, 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 in the Greek is really interesting because it's, it's to seize something like almost violently. Like to just grab it and just grab hold of it. And the two times this is used, one is of, of Jesus when he grabs Peter, right? You know, Peter went out there and said, Jesus, I'm going to walk on the water like you, right? And what did he do? He started to sink and Jesus grabs him. It's the same word here. It's the same word used of Paul uh, in Acts chapter 21 when he is seized while he's preaching in the temple and he's seized and dragged out by the crowd. It was a violent laying hold of. But that's the imagery Paul is trying to give to Timothy here. About what he's to do with this eternal life. You're to seize it, lay hold of it, and not let go of it. Like hold on to it for dear life. Take hold of this. Make it your own and live it to the full. We have to do the same thing. We have to do the very same thing. We can run this race seizing eternal life now. How can we do that? By remembering that the outcome of this life has already been secured for us. This goes back to the whole issue of sanctification. Is this something you're doing on your own in your own effort? Or is this something you're doing by the Spirit's power and in the grace of God? We take hold of the eternal life now because Jesus has already crossed the finish line. Now, Paul can write, I have finished the race. Why did he finish the race? Because Christ already finished the race. Why will you finish the race? Because Christ has already finished the race. Why can you take hold of eternal life? Because Christ has already taken hold of eternal life for us. Think about this. You're running this race, and I know, yeah, it's a struggle, and we trip and fall and face plant over and over again in this Christian life. But guess what? Your place on the medal stand has already been secured. What difference would it make running this Christian life, knowing what we face, the spiritual warfare, the battle for our faith, the battle for our faith, but if we ran this race knowing, I'm going to medal in the end anyway. Why? He's already won the gold medal on my behalf. Because that wreath, that victor's crown is already upon Jesus. It's mine as well in him. It makes a whole difference in your Christian walk. He's already crossed the finish line. He's already done this for us. So this eternal life he's talking about is ours now and will be more fully and completely then. So he reminds them of some key things in regards to taking hold of the eternal life and their encouragements. The first, he says, is that he's been called to this. He has been called to this. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. He was called. That means if God called him, then God's going to see to it that he fulfills that call. That calling secured his rightful place, not just as a minister of God, not just as an apostolic delegate. Think about our calling. Think about how you were called, the effectual call of our God. Is that a maybe thing? That's not a maybe thing. That is a 100% sure thing. If we are of Christ, if we are in Christ, if we are in union with Christ... We've been called, this is ours. We are God's children. We are part of God's family. We are part of the household of God. We are part of the bride of Christ. That means God has called us to his side. If God has called us to his side, can we fail this thing? Can we? Truthfully, I know we feel like we fail. And I know there are snapshots of our life that look like failure. But when we cross the tape, will we have failed? No. Not at all. For us to have failed, Christ would have to have failed. Christ did not fail in what he accomplished for us, brothers and sisters. He has been called to this. God is fighting for him. God is with him. God is with us. 
and God is fighting for us. We can take hold of this life now, this eternal life now, because God is with us and he's fighting for us. And then he calls to mind something very important for Timothy. It says here, too, that he's not just taking hold of the eternal life to which he was called, but about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He says to Timothy, not only were you called, but you also confessed this faith. You also made a public confession of the faith. Most likely, and some commentators are thinking, well, this is an ordination. I, I, I tend to side on that he's referring to his baptism, because where do believers make a public profession or confession of faith? It's, it's at baptism, before the presence of many witnesses. He's calling to mind the moment that Timothy took his stand with the Lord Jesus. Timothy, you've been called, and Timothy, you've already chosen sides. You've already declared your allegiance to Jesus Christ. This is why you're to take hold of eternal life. This is why you can seize it and live in it and enjoy it and walk in this, even though the task to which you're called is arduous and difficult, and you're going to be opposed from within and without. He's already chosen sides. Timothy needed that reminder. You and I need that reminder, brothers and sisters. Now, if you've not been baptized, please see me after the service. I'd like to talk to you about baptism and why that's important in the Christian's life and what it represents and what it means. But if you've made a public declaration of allegiance to Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, you need to remind yourself of that in the daily struggles of life. Not only were you called to be in Christ. But you've already said, Lord, I'm yours. And for the presence of many witnesses, you've already declared whose sides you're on. You're on. And if you've already taken sides, what else is there, brothers and sisters? Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of these things. They're ours. They're ours. Life and ministry are tough and challenging. So we can stand, we can stand firm knowing that we've taken a public uh, made a public confession in baptism so we can walk faithfully in the eternal life that's been granted to us. Now, when we come to verses 17 and 19 here, through 19 here, that seems like, oh, wow, he's talking to Timothy, and now he's like, hey, uh, remind those rich people of this kind of stuff, and it, and it feels like disconnected. But I really see this as so connected because it's it's it's... It's instructive in that it's going to provide a tangible example to those who are in the church. Now, he's not talking about the ones earlier in there, the contented poor, right? Because he's telling them, say, hey, look, godliness with contentment is great gain. And here's why we need to be content. And with food and clothing, with these we'll be content. Now he's talking and addressing those who have more than food and clothing, more than food and clothing, all right? They would be considered rich. And as I said last week, that would more than likely include all of us in this room. We are rich in comparison to these first century believers here. But it's a, it's a tangible example of what those who have means can do to take hold of the eternal life. How they can flee evil. How they can pursue good. How they can fight the good fight of faith. And how they can take hold of the eternal life. Look, look what he just gives them some quick instructions here. He tells them uh, in that short passage there, he tells them not, uh, not to uh, become puffed up because of their wealth. Hey, you've got more than everyone else. Don't become an arrogant fool. He tells them also not to trust in their riches. The uncertainty of riches he talks about there. Why? Well, you got, might have riches today. You might have nothing tomorrow. All those stocks you invested in, they're going to tank. The real estate market may crash. Your 401k drops to a pitiful level. You could lose possessions, material possessions in life. Do not set your hope. Do not place your trust in these things. Rather, he says, set your hope on whom? On God. Because God's the source. God is the one who richly provides all things, he says, for our enjoyment. So set your hope on God. Don't set your hope on the uncertainty of riches. Tells them to be generous. God made them rich or God gave them riches. Why? So that they can be a blessing to others. Be generous. Be rich in giving. Do good with your resources because it is godliness with contentment 
That is great gain. As a result, he says, they're going to be storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Who else has told us to store up treasure somewhere else? Isn't that what Jesus told his disciples? Don't store up your treasure here with stuff. Store for yourselves treasure in heaven. Paul's reiterating the same thing here. But here's the link of where I see this connected to what what he's instructing Timothy. And it's right there in verse uh, 19, uh, 19b. So that, he says, the rich, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. He's saying the same thing here. The rich do these things. Here is how they're taking hold of that which is truly life, taking hold of eternal life. Instructions for them, instructions for us here today. That is exactly how you and I should live. It goes back to what we talked about last week. Is Christ enough? Are we content with what God has already given to us and what we have in Jesus Christ? And if God has blessed you with over and above means, wonderful. That's not evil. You can enjoy those things in so much as you remember what you're supposed to do with those things. It is God who has richly provided things. Don't trust in those things. Trust in Him. Set your hope in Him and live open-handedly. We should all live that way. It's a way we take hold of eternal life. And the last commandment, keep. We're going to finish this, guys. We're going to do it. Hang on. Hang on. 13 and 14. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained, free from reproach, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. Now, this is a strong charge, this, this last one here. And he's going to state this charge by appealing to two uh, impe- unimpeachable witnesses, undeniable witnesses, God the Father and Christ Jesus, right? This is a big deal. He's saying, I'm charging this to you, where? In the very presence of God and of Christ Jesus. He's calling heaven to witness this very charge. I love that phrase. This is not a unique phrase of Paul's here. He uses it a few times. In the presence of God. Paul lived his life continuously with with this awareness that everything he did in life and ministry was before the presence of God. It's what the reformers, you know, talk about. The phrase used often, often is quorum deo, right? Which means before the face of God. All of life is lived that way. Now, we don't always live that with that awareness, We forget as we go through our day-to-day life that everything we say, everything we do, every thought, every, every word spoken, every deed done is done before the presence of the Almighty God. And we're to live in light of that. We're to live knowing that and aware of that continually. And Paul did here as well. Our world presents to us an alternate reality. There is no God, or God doesn't care, or God is far off removed, or you can have your own truth apart from God, on and on and on. The truth is, everything is done before the gaze of our God, before the very presence of the, uh, of the Almighty God and Creator. Now, we, we read this charge, and it says, in the presence of God, and we feel like, man, that's kind of intimidating. He's not trying to intimidate Timothy. He's not trying to bully him. He's not trying to guilt him. He's not trying to put some fear into him. These are actually meant to be encouragements and exhortations. You know, look what he writes here. Um, in the presence of God, to keep this command, but he, but he talks about here the God who gives life to all things. The God who gives life to all things. Again, he's not trying to scare him. You know, he's not trying to say, hey, they're watching you, Timothy. Make sure you don't screw up. Don't jack this thing up. No, it's before the the God who gives life to all things. This is the one who gives life. This is the sustainer of all things. Timothy, this God who gives life to all things, he's going to give life to you. He's going to sustain you. He's going to empower you. He's going to enable you to keep this very charge, to do these very things that you have been instructed and commanded to do. This is a big deal. God, the one who gives life, will be on your side. He is on your side, and he'll see you through all of this. 
It is the very encouragement, brothers and sisters, you and I need in our day-to-day life. God is for us if we're in Christ. God is with us. God is there to help us. He fights for us. I need to be reminded of that every single day of my life. When I'm tempted to doubt, when I'm tempted to unbelieve, when I'm tempted in, in my struggles in life, I've got to remember this. If I'm in Christ, these things are mine. If I'm in Christ, God is not against me. There are some I know in this room who struggle in their Christian walk and they feel like God is against them. That it's almost like it's God is just continually pressing them you know, to the wall in everything in their life. And they're laden with guilt and they're laden with shame. That's not the gospel, brothers and sisters. That's not the grace of God. You know we're advocates here of walking in purity and holiness. But we we remember why we do that. Why we strive for purity and holiness. It is not for acceptance. It is not to gain the love of God. It is not to gain favor with God. It is not to get God on our side. That's an, already, that's an already present reality for us now. We can do it joyfully, willingly, because of already, what we are already in Christ Jesus. And then, it's before Christ, who made the good confession before Pontius Pilate. And I know this sounds like a really obscure thing to say, but the point he's making is, Christ is the example Timothy, of what it is to be a faithful witness. He was a faithful witness. When did he make the good confession before Pontius Pilate? When he was standing before him, when he was brought before Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? He didn't deny it, did he? You say that I am. Every gospel writer references that. In John's gospel, in John 18, he goes a little bit further. Telling Pilate, my kingdom's not of this world. Well, in saying my kingdom, what is he saying? Yeah, I am the king. My kingdom is not of this world. And he tells Pilate, I came to bear witness of the truth. And it cost him his life, didn't it? He made the good confession. Before Pontius Pilate, in Revelation 1.5, you know, in John's greeting there, to the, to the seven churches, he refers to Jesus Christ as the faithful witness. In the letter to the church at Laodicea, in the very greeting, he says, these are the words of the faithful witness. Jesus, the faithful witness, has already gone before us as the faithful witness as our example so that you and I can be a faithful witness as well. To make the good confession. To bear witness of the truth. He is the example of the faithful witness we are all called to be. So he's calling God the Father and Christ Jesus the Son as faithful witnesses now before this charge that he gives them to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. Well, what commandment is he talking about? It's shorthand for everything he's told them already. It's everything. All of apostolic teaching, all of the teachings of Christ, all of these admonishments of of what Timothy is to do in the church and for the church of Jesus Christ. He's to keep those things faithfully, faithfully, knowing that it is God who's going to enable him to do it and to keep these things. Knowing that Jesus is, is the example he is to follow as the faithful witness when things are going to get tough. And all of those things are to be kept. How long? For how long is he to do that? Until Christ's return. How long are you and I supposed to be faithful? Until Christ's return. And when is he going to return? (laughs) At the proper time, he writes here, right? At the appointed time. Not what your TV preacher says. Okay? They've all missed it. And they will continue to miss it. Until Jesus returns returns be faithful be faithful unto them is it any wonder why paul breaks into this moment of spontaneous praise and worship this 
amazing doxological outburst that he engages in here. Uh, after he's saying all these things to him, it's like he's writing these things, and it's like heaven opens up to him, and he's just blown away at this sovereign God, the sovereign creator, the sovereign king of the universe. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Timothy, here's how I know you're going to succeed. Here's how I know you're going to be able to flee and pursue and fight and take hold and keep these things and do what I've charged you to do because this is the God we serve. That is so mind-blowing and exciting. So I was studying this, this week. I mean, I couldn't be overwhelmed which is it, it cheers and just full of worship myself. Because this isn't something we white knuckle. This isn't something we're going to do on our own, in our own effort. Look who we serve. Look who this God is. He is beyond all human control or manipulation. He transcends every single thing. The extent of his rule is universal. It is everlasting. He is unmatched. He is all unrivaled, all powerful, eternal, and only to him belong all honor and glory and dominion. And if that doesn't excite you, you need to get saved. <laughs> you need to know this Jesus. Because to make this confession of faith, It's just declare that this is who he is. This is who we serve. So it doesn't matter what we face. It doesn't matter the intensity of the spiritual warfare. It doesn't matter how hard it gets and how difficult this life be. He is unchanging. This is who he is. And because this is who he is, he will see us through all the way to the end. I'm out of breath. When you feel overwhelmed. I don't know, again, we feel beaten down daily spiritually. I mean, the warfare is real. Life is tough. You might be going through a difficult marriage, a difficult relationship with your kids, problems at work, struggling with temptation in life, you know, on and on and on. You might be afflicted physically, mentally, emotionally. We need to remind ourselves of this. This is our God. And what he called us to would be impossible if he weren't in it. If he hasn't richly provided all things for us to be able to live this out and walk this out. Again, these are not, these five directives aren't, directives aren't just for spiritual leaders, pastors, and elders. It's for all of us. We're all called to remain faithful in life and ministry until until he returns. Until he returns. And it may feel overwhelming until we get to the very last words of this letter. His closing. Grace be with you. Grace. And I love, I don't like the way the ESV did it here because... That you is plural. And you read this last phrase. You may think he's only saying that to Timothy. He's not. Grace be with you all. What was on Paul's mind here was the church. I'm not saying the ESV is wrong. You is the correct translation. But it's y'all in the south here. (laughs) You all. It's the church. It's for all of us. Grace be with all of you. How do we do this? Only through the grace of our Lord. (laughs) Only filled with the grace of God. Timothy couldn't do it on his own. He couldn't do it on his own effort, and neither can we. And if you've trusted in Christ Jesus, if you've placed your faith in Him, and your hope is in the gospel, and you've made the good confession, this is encouragement for you. The grace of our Lord will see you through this. You and I do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. We take hold of from victory. We flee and pursue 
from the place that Christ has already won for us. He's won the war. He's won the war. We'll have a million skirmishes from here to the end, but the war has already been won. So fight the good fight of the faith, brothers and sisters.